thank you for joining our online service in Living Word IT Park. You may join us every Sunday at 10 a.m. for our English service. You may also give your love offering through online bank transfer or over-the-counter direct deposit. Bank details are shown on the screen. Good morning, Church. It is such a privilege that I can serve you today through the preaching of God's Word. And today, we will be ending the first chapter of the book of Philippians. And before we start, let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. This is the day that you have made. And God, we will rejoice in it. We will be glad in it because of your goodness and faithfulness in our life. Today, Lord, as we listen to your word, may you anoint each one's ears. May you anoint my preparation, the words that will come out to my mouth, Lord, comes from you and will really minister to your people. Hide me behind the cross, O Lord God, that you alone be magnified and glorified. This we pray. Amen. I entitle today's sermon, A Genuine Christian Living. I say genuine Christian living because nowadays, a lot of people profess they are Christian, but we can hardly identify the genuineness and or truthfulness in how the way they live their lives. And even there is a lot of Christian this day that the life that they are manifesting is false Christianity different from what they profess. So, how can we know if a Christian is genuine? How should a genuine Christian live? What characteristics should make a true Christian stand out from non-Christian and those with a false profession of faith? Paul will give us some answer to this question this morning in our study of Philippians chapter 1, 27 to 30. In this first chapter, verse 3 to 11, Paul has reminded the Philippians how much he loves them and prays for them. Verse 12 to 26, he shares about his present situation then his future situations, which may mean freedom from house arrest in Rome for Paul. Or it may mean his death by beheading. Yet in all of it, Paul is rejoicing because live or die, because of Christ, Paul can either enjoy more of Christ now, or all of Christ later. Yet, regardless of how much better heaven is, Paul has chosen to give up his wants to of heaven in order to remain here and minister to the Philippians. So in verse 27-30, we find that Paul changes the focus from himself to the Philippians. From talking about his situations to their circumstances. And instead of talking about the privileges of being a Christian, Paul talks about obligations. From narrative to imperative. So the transition in verse 27 is direct as he now begins to address specific issues with them. So if you have your Bibles with you, 
Let's open our Bibles in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 to 30. And it says there, Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. In no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. I will be making two points to this outline. First, a genuine Christian living has a right response to the gospel. Second, a genuine Christian living has a right perspective of sufferings. Now, Paul begins his mini section by issuing this command to the Philippians that they must live in a manner worthy of the gospel. So before we dive in into the passage, let's first Take a look at what does Paul mean here when he says, live in a manner worthy of the gospel. We have to be careful here. No, because part of the gospel message is that we are not worthy. We do not earn or deserve God's favor in our lives. We have all sinned against God and are deserving of judgment. And yet, the good news of the gospel is that God sent His Son, Jesus, to die for our sins, to bring us back to God. So the gospel is all about God's grace. And grace has nothing to do with being worthy. It's just the opposite. So we were not worthy to receive God's salvation, but God gives us His salvation as free gift. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when we talk about living worthy of the gospel, we are not talking about living in such a way as to earn the benefits of the gospel. Rather, we are talking about living in such a way to reflect the reality that God has already forgiven you in Christ. If you are in Christ, God has forgiven your sins. He has adopted you as His child. He has given you His Holy Spirit to guide you. He promises always to be with you and He will never leave or forsake you. So those are amazing gifts from God. And they should make a difference in how you live your life. You cannot live worthy to receive the gospel. Friends, rather you should live worthy of the gospel which you have received. And that's what Paul is saying here in this passage. And this is also my first point. A genuine Christian living has a right response to the gospel. Verse 27, Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. See the word only at the beginning. The word only here means just one thing. This and this only. Now Paul's focus in life is the gospel 
and living in a manner worthy of the gospel. And this is what he says to the Philippians. Only nothing else, only this and this alone, only now conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. To paraphrase this, brethren, what Paul is saying is, live in a way that honors and glorifies the gospel. Or live in a way that is consistent with the demands of the gospel. Church, the gospel calls for our faith in Christ. It calls for our denial of self, death to self in obedience to God. Submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The gospel calls us for us to leave the world behind and to follow Christ. This is how we enter the kingdom and this is how we are to continue in the kingdom. Conducting ourselves in the manner worthy of the gospel. Now let's continue. Conduct yourself. Take note. This verb is in the imperative mode. Which means, church, it is a command. It is not an indicative statement. It is not a suggestion. It is not a mere wish. It is not a desire that Paul has for them. This is actually a commandment from God. Through the Apostle Paul, that requires the immediate obedience of every believer. And this is a command for us Christians today. It is in a present tense, which means this is to be your ongoing manner of living. And this is what Paul wants to the church in Philippi. That they will continually live in a life that is worthy of the gospel. Whether he comes and see them or remain absent. Church, our conduct is very important to God. How we live our life is of extreme importance to God as believers. No believers are to ever have indifference attitude and be passive in their Christian life, but with great intentionality and aggressive faith, we are to conduct ourselves in a certain manner. Now, this is a very unique word, conduct yourself. It is one word in the original Greek, and it comes from a Greek word from which we derive the English word politics. Political or politician. The root word police means city and the idea is to be a citizen in a city or in a city state. So the Philippians under understood this concept. They, they live in a free Roman city and thus understood from their own experience what it means to live as citizens. They have all the privileges and obligations. So that is the very word that is used here. It denotes civil responsibilities in an earthly citizenship. It is a very technical word. It is not that normal word for obey or keep or heed. It is a specific word that had exceptional meaning for the Philippians. And Paul is here picking up on that motif and elevating it to the citizenship of heaven. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, he pointed out that for our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait 
for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying he, saying is, you believers in Philippi, you enjoy a very privileged status in the Roman Empire. And there is an illusion here that you need to be a good citizen in the Roman Empire. But more than that, you are a member of a higher empire, a much higher kingdom, the kingdom of God in the kingdom of heaven. And there are laws and regulations that the king of kings has put in place. And as you live as a believer, you are under moral obligations to be a good citizen in the kingdom of heaven. So just as the Philippians valued their earthly Roman citizenship, in a greater way, the believers should value their heavenly citizenship with Christ. And note, this is a permanent obligation. This is a responsibility as a Christian. As Warren Worsby explained, we Christians are the citizens of heaven. And while we are on earth, we ought to behave like heaven's citizens. So not only should we behave this way simply because of our heavenly citizenship, but we should also behave in this manner to show the world we are different. Now the question, brethren, how are you doing? Does your walk match your talk? Or are you so timid that the people around you have no idea you are even a believer in Jesus Christ? So Paul commanded us, commanded the Philippi, the church in Philippi, only, only conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. Now, to live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ means for you and me to live in submission to the Lordship of Christ. For us to realize that my life is not my own, that I have been bought with a price, and that I must live for the glory of God, that every agenda in my life is to bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what it means for me to live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, as Paul begins this small section in the book of Philippians, he begins to urge you to conduct yourself, to live as citizens of a higher kingdom in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you understand what the Lord requires of you this day, church? Do you see very clearly in His Word that this is laid at each and every one of our feet? Every step that we take in this world, every word that we utter, Every decision that we make, every action and reaction that we undertake here upon this earth, we are to conduct ourselves in a manner that is consistent with and brings honor and glory to the very gospel that has saved us. Now Paul in Philippians 27 verse, verse 27 to 8 mentions three specific areas in which he wanted the Philippian believers to demonstrate a manner of life worthy of the gospel of Christ. And this is for us today as a church. He says, Only conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I may 
I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, and no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but for but of salvation for you, and that too from God. So first, they must be standing together for the gospel. Notice he goes on to say in verse 27c, let me begin at the beginning no? of the verse, only conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you remain absent, I will hear of you. This is what Paul wants to hear. Whether he is there or whether he is absent, he said, I want to hear this. That you are standing firm in one spirit and in one mind. So the idea of standing firm is to hold our ground, to be anchored in a place. And it was used in a military settings of a soldier that refused to yield his position regardless of personal danger. The soldier submitted himself to something of greater importance than just his individual life. He served and put himself at risk for the benefit of his fellow soldiers and the nation they all serve. So the figurative usage here is to hold fast to your belief and principles. Regardless of personal cost, a Christian needs to be firmly rooted in biblical truth and refuse to compromise those truths even when it is not easy to do or even results in persecution of one kind or another. Here in Philippines, such persecution is usually limited to ridicule and disdain but can also escalate into consequences on the job of not being promoted or even fired because of a stand for biblical ethics. Increasingly, there is political persecution against biblical Christianity in terms of loss of rights, financial penalties, and even on occasion, incarceration. But in other places around the world, persecution also includes physical persecution, torture, and even death. Why? Because the Christian believes God in his word and refuses to contradict it. They stand firmly on each truth and refuse to be moved. As Christians, no? And that's the reason why Paul is in prison. Why he was persecuted because he's, he's standing firm and immovable because of his conviction in the gospel. As Christians, we should take seriously Jesus' warning about it. We should expect to have tribulation in this world. And for sinful people to insult us in all kinds of evil against us falsely because of righteousness and Christ's sake. If they hated the Jesus, we can expect them to hate us too. Paul's command here is to con conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ by standing firm when such persecution comes. Standing firm is to hold on to your conviction and not be swayed from living according to the truth regardless of persecution or personal enticement. This is not always easy, but the more deeply we hold our convictions, the, more, the easier it is to stand firm. I repeat, the more deeply we hold our convictions, the easier it is to stand firm. 
In addition, we are to stand firm with other believers. Paul's full statement here is that they are standing firm in one spirit, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So another aspect of this standing firm is in resisting the temptation that come against us to compromise our faith for reasons other than fear. We must stand firm on walking in righteousness even when we are enticed by the evil around us. Remember, church, Satan will do all of his might to destroy your life and to destroy the church. That's why in verse 27, in one spirit, with one mind. The one spirit in one mind here point out the unity that Christians are to have with one another. Paul will expand on that in chapter 2, but here is it is brought up because Christians need to stand firm together. Christians are not to be hermits. We are to work together in helping each other walk with Christ. Paul's explanation of the body concept of the church in Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and Ephesians 4 stress how each believer is, is, is equipped by God to serve in the church for the benefit of the whole body. Church, we need each other. Many commentators take the reference to one spirit to be to the Holy Spirit. If so, then Paul would have to be calling them to, to a unified front of standing firm together because of their common communion with the Holy Spirit who had baptized each of them into one body. However, the context here seems to be more in reference to the spirit of each individual believer, which is why the English translations do not capitalize the word as they do when it is taught that it is a reference to the Holy Spirit. So in this case, the unity of spirit is having each of them possessing the same conviction. I think we will all agree that it is a lot easier to stand for what you believe when there are others who also feel the same way that you do and are standing with you. Right? The idea of one mind translated variously as mind, soul, and heart adds in a unity of thoughts in additions to emotion and will. Adding this spirit and soul together and the Christian is to be unified in all that makes them human and delivers. So again, Paul will expand on this theme of unity in chapter 2. But for here, common belief, desires and priorities make for a strong bond for both defense and offense. Together, we are to stand firm against whatever is opposed to the gospel, while at the same time, together we are more effective in proclaiming the gospel which Paul brings out at the end of the verse. So Paul's first instruction is to standing together for the gospel. Second, he tells us to striving together as a team for the gospel. Striving together, it is just one word in the original language. In English word, it is atleo, athlete, athletics. And the idea is to compete in a contest of wrestling. So as a fellow Christians, we share a common goal of proclaiming Christ to the nations. While in many groups that have a common goal, there is an eternal competition for positions within the group that is not to be in Christianity. We are on the same team. 
we are to strive with, not against one another, we sacrifice our own position and welfare for the common good because it is not about any individual's power, prestige, or position. It is all about the glorification and the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And for the Church of Philippi to be striving together for the gospel means they must maintain their unity and their fellowship. Again, any division and their fellowship will mean defeat for the full team. And it will, be, it will mean defeat for the advancement of the gospel. They can only advance the gospel as they strive together. And in fact, this was already a pressing danger in the church of Philippi. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 2, Paul commanded these two women who cannot get along to live in harmony in the Lord. He says in verse 2, I urge, notice, he urged both of them. He puts the responsibility with both. You need to be peace, peacemakers. You need to be reconcilers so that the whole church can stand together in unity. Here, Paul is not just instructing them to stand together for the gospel. He is not just instructing them to striving together as a team for the gospel. He also instructing instructing them to not fear. Verse 28, In no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them. Verse 28, Paul encouraged them concerning the opposition they were facing. In no way alarmed by your opponents. This is the third element that demonstrates a worthy walk with Christ is not being in fear of the enemies of Christianity or what we might suffer at their hands. So I, the idea here is not a fear that paralyzes, but rather one that might cause either the serious, fearful concerning of worry or a running away such as when one is startled. Believers are not to be controlled by either fear or worry. We can place our trust in God and have peace in whatever He allows, just as Paul did in his own circumstances, which included the possible extreme of life or death. In no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. I want you in no way to be alarmed by your opponents. Maybe the opponents that Paul's referring to are those mentioned in chapter 3, verse 2. And he says, which is a sign. Sign here is an indicator of something or that points to something. It is a powerful witness or testimony. It is an evidence mark. And what Paul is saying is this, that as you stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are making a loud, clear statement. It is such a strong statement that it is a sign. It is an evidence. It is a sign of the truthfulness of the gospel that you are willing to suffer for it, that you are willing to pray to pay a price, that you will, you will not be turned one against another, but that you will stand firm and stand strong in the gospel. So it is clear testimony to unbelievers of the truthfulness of, of what you believe. Now, when you exercise unconditional love for your brothers and your sisters in Christ, you will stand with them. 
he says it is a sign of distractions to them. In other words, it verifies the truthfulness of the gospel that you believe. It is a strong statement of faith. Now they may not have eyes to see it, but it nevertheless is there. And no bickering is worth giving up your testimony to unbelievers. And then second, he says, it is a sign of salvation for you. It is a testimony to you that you are really saved because if you keep on not standing firm and strong in the gospel, it calls into question your salvation. It calls into question whose sides are you on. But when you stand strong with other believers in the gospel and choose to promote unity inside the church, it is a sign of your salvation. It brings assurance of your salvation that God is at work in my life and that there is true love in my heart for my brothers and sisters in Christ. And the last two words in verse 8, 28, he says, And that true from God. So the destruction is from God. And salvation is from God. And how you stand strong and stand firm is a powerful sign to a watching world and to your unsaved family members and to your unsaved neighbors and to those that you work for and with. It is a sign of their destruction if they do not believe in it. It is a sign of your salvation to yourself that you are a true believer in Jesus Christ. It is an amazing thing how in times of persecution, very few people are struggling with assurance of salvation because it forces the issue, whose side are you on? Church, are you willing to take some hits for the Lord? Because false converts cave in when the persecution comes. And this brings me to my last point. A genuine Christian living has a right perspective of suffering. In verse 29 and 30, Paul wraps up his immediate thoughts by pointing out again the confidence they could have in God, in the midst of any suffering they would incur. For to you, it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. The word here for be, being granted is the verb form for grace. So Paul viewed both their salvation and suffering as gift from God. It is not hard for us to understand that believing in Jesus is a gift of grace from God, right? We were dead in our trespasses and sin and opposition to God. Yet He provided for our salvation through Jesus' substitutionary death on the cross for our sins. God convicted us of our sins and enabled us to believe that we would turn from sin to Christ and be saved. All of it is a wonderful gift given to us when we in no way deserve it. But what is harder for us to comprehend is that suffering for Christ's sake is also a gift of grace from God. Do you see your suffering right now because of Christ's sake is a gift or privilege? I know that most of us immediately would like God to withhold that gift. But we need to remember, church, that our lives are not about ourselves, but about God's glory. So suffering for Christ's sake is direct evidence that we are living for God's glory. For all who strive to live 
godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 2 Timothy 3.12 In John 15.18, we can also expect those who hate Jesus also hate us. Again, that hatred is a confirmation that they can see Jesus living in us. And that brings glory to God. In addition, God uses the tribulation of persecution to help us mature. If our goal is to be like Jesus Christ, then we can exult in our tribulations. For we can be sure that God is using them to accomplish that goal. God sanctifies us in suffering. When suffering for Christ is properly understood, it is most certainly a privilege, a gracious grant. Amen? Albert Barnes comments that to this, It is a privilege thus to suffer in the cause of Christ because we then resemble the Lord Jesus and are united with Him in trials. Two, we have evidence that we are His if trials come upon us in His cause. Third, because we are engaged in a good cause and the privilege of maintaining such a cause is worth much of suffering. And fourth, because it will be connected with a brighter crown and more exalted honor in heaven. And Paul in verse 30 continually no, say, Experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Paul in verse 30 tells us of his struggles. When we go through battles, it's easy to think that we are alone in our suffering. Right? But Paul reminds us that everyone suffers because of our faith. So the next time you struggle, remember you are not alone and pray for your fellow soldiers in battle. So the Philippians and we have Paul's own example on how to understand and properly respond God's grace, gifts of suffering for Jesus' sake. And we overcome our circumstances, including suffering, by looking to see what God is doing in the midst of it. Paul did, did that and rejoiced, and so did the rest of the apostles. We can do the same as we conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. So a genuine Christian living has a right response to the gospel. A genuine Christian living has a right perspective of suffering. Church, are you a genuine Christian? Are you living in a way that honors and glorifies the gospel? Or living in a way that consistent with the demands of the gospel? We say that the clothes a person is wearing becomes them or it does something for them or that 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 suit is not them or doesn't become them we mean that the color of the cut or the cut of the clothes enhances the face or personality of a person or we say that dress doesn't do a thing for you or that suit is not you Church, as you believe and put your trust to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, did that change the way how you live your life? Did the world notice it? Can they identify the genuineness or truthfulness in how you live your life. 
There's a saying, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Our life should reflect Jesus Christ. Our lifestyle should become us or enhance us so that others see Jesus reflected in us. Are you a genuine Christian? Are you living a genuine Christian life? For the first time who hear this command of Paul to conduct yourself worthy manner of the gospel. You cannot live a life worthy of the gospel if you don't have Jesus Christ in your life. Maybe this this is the time, no? For you to accept Jesus, to believe in His finished works, to put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And as you do, live a life that is worthy of the gospel. This is a command for all the believers of Christ. And it is our responsibility to obey this command as we, as we are submitting ourselves to the Lordship of Christ. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for your word today. Lord, we ask for forgiveness if a lot of times we are conducting ourselves different from what we are professing. Lord, today we pray as your word convict us, help us to conduct ourselves to live our lives worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us to show the world that Christ lived in us and that we are living for the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, it's all about you. It's all about for your glory. So we pray, God, be magnified and glorified in our lives. This we pray. Amen.